January 1st, 945. Our homeland was collapsing in fire and smoke. Waves of Allied bombers covered the skies over the cities and industrial centres. Homes and streets burned nightly with flowing streams of glowing asphalt. The innocent, the women and children, were dying by the thousands, their bodies reduced to glowing embers in the phosphorescent maelstrom. The borders of the homeland we had known were shrinking before a relentless combination of powerful enemies. The destruction and defeat that we had for so long refused to acknowledge was becoming reality. On the 2nd of January of the new year, I stood with the four other members of the division who had also been credited with the destruction of enemy tanks in close combat. At the 18th Army headquarters, the commanding officer, General de Infanterie Ehrenfried Boerge, had summoned us to his headquarters to recognise our actions. The general's staff was situated in an old, picturesque estate, with an ancient manor built in the style of an 18th century fortress, surrounded by a beautiful park. The branches of the massive trees that bracketed the imposing structure lay heavy with snow. In a small neighbouring dwelling we received haircuts and were shaved by the staff barber in preparation for our meeting with the general. An aide waited patiently for the barber to complete his task, and we were then briskly led into the hall of the castle. A heavy panelled door opened, and we sprang to attention as the arrival of our commander was announced. We were presented to a grey-haired gentleman in whose eyes one could clearly recognise the heavy burden of responsibility, especially in these waning days, that he was carrying for so many in our beleaguered Courland army. He warmly shook hands with each of us, pausing momentarily to ask obligatory questions as he awarded each member of our party with the silver and black tank destruction badge. He then presented us with a small quantity of cognac and tobacco thanking us again for our valuable service to the fatherland before advising us of our additional reward of furlough, and we were then dismissed to return to our units. A widespread prohibition on furloughs had been in effect since the summer months. Travel to Germany was no longer permitted, possibly due in part to the massive destruction of our cities and industrial centres by Allied bombers, which was evident in all densely populated areas. This ban had been in effect for the Kurland army, with an exception for those who had earned special merit, which included the destruction of an enemy tank with small arms or explosives. This was by definition limited to special anti-tank-shaped charges, mines or panzerfausts. In these special cases, home leave would be permitted. The following day, the 3rd of January, accompanied by the four men, a Feldwebel, two Obergefreiters and a Gefreiter, I boarded a fishing vessel at midday that had been pressed into the service of the Kriegsmarine in the harbour of Libau, and we were soon steaming west over the Baltic toward the homeland. Packed into an Alpine Corps rucksack were my few belongings and a portion of smoked horse meat to serve as march rations on my journey. I had also carefully packed the oil painting of my protecting Madonna, which had remained by my side since our withdrawal from Picalii. We steamed to the ancient port city of Danzig, where we arrived following an uneventful eight-hour transit through the Baltic. There we departed the ship during the night, and after taking quarters in the Hotel Stettiner Hof, the following morning we began the journey home towards South Germany and the Rhine. While en route we observed firsthand the destroyed cities and factories. We experienced the hopelessness of the people, the innocents who suffered for the folly of others, the pain of the women and children whom we were supposed to be protecting in the trenches of Courland. Knowing that our relatives and others lived in daily terror of the bombs, left us with no joy at being home again. We had escaped one inferno to be thrust into another, different form of purgatory, where our personal risk facing the enemy was slight. However, we remained powerless to stop the waves of bombers that flew over us with impunity. Here there was no taking up a Panzerfaust or an assault rifle to repel the enemy. One could only helplessly wait. There was little pleasure in being away from our accustomed environment. While visiting my father, I received an indication of the extent of the evil practices that our leaders had brought upon the world. My father, who served as a police official, confided in me his questions and assumptions regarding the fate of our citizens considered as undesirable by our brown-clad leaders. He spoke of numerous death certificates for people held in custody by the government, received in the past months from various government agencies. 
sometimes accompanied by the sparse belongings of the deceased. It cannot be possible, he stated to me in confidence, that so many people could die of heart failure. Something is terribly wrong. This observation, accompanied by more subtle evidence occasionally detected in our daily lives, served to reveal crimes committed by the government that could not be denied. I was shocked to see the destruction that had befallen the city of Stuttgart. Accustomed to the sight of burned villages and destroyed facilities on the Eastern Front, I was nevertheless distressed to observe that entire population centres had been reduced to blackened piles of rubble. Hit especially hard during the bombing campaign of September 1st, 944, much of Stuttgart lay in ruins. The residence of the former Württemberg royal family, the New Palace, was totally destroyed, and from gaping, shattered windows, the once elegant draperies could be observed waving softly in the wind that whistled through the blackened ruins. Throughout the city, labour units consisting of prisoners of war, Hitler youth groups, and conscripted foreign workers toiled to clear streets and facilities of rubble. Signs were posted on buildings and street corners, advising that looters would be shot. Photography of any damage was strictly forbidden and punishable by severe penalty. The city I had known in my youth had disappeared in a hideous pile of ash and rubble. I journeyed to the Black Forest town of Dornstetten to visit my grandparents, and I was relieved to find the outlying towns and villages still intact, relatively untouched by the catastrophe that had befallen the larger cities. Encouraged to visit relatives, I took a commuter train to Mullica. En route, we came under attack by a single American fighter bomber, which strafed the length of the slow-moving, defenceless train. The aircraft's board weapons disabled the locomotive, which slowly screeched to a stop, steam and smoke pouring in great clouds toward the crystal-clear winter sky. Panic-stricken, the passengers fled from the carriages to seek shelter in the surrounding terrain, as the plane banked and, with motor howling, began a second strafing run. I attempted to assist several passengers in their efforts to disembark before throwing myself onto the ground as the plane passed overhead, machine guns rattling as the low-flying aircraft struck the locomotive again with impunity. Within seconds, the attack was over. I had experienced my first and only direct contact with the American enemy, and that on my home soil. Miraculously, only a small number of passengers suffered slight injuries, and after some hours we were able to continue our journey. In the first days of February, I reported to the General Commando, which had been transferred to Ludwigsburg following the destruction of the headquarters in Stuttgart. It was necessary to report back from leave to the military officials, and thus initiate my return to my unit in Kurland. At the front desk in the duty office, I was met by a Stabsfeldwebel, who commented on my decorations. Learning that I was returning from leave and would be reporting back to my division in Kurland, he remarked that my experience at the front, particularly in close combat against enemy armour, would be put to better use here. He added that personnel with such experience were being sought to train Hitler youth members in the use and tactics of Panzerfaust weapons, in preparation for the impending invasion of Germany by the Western Allies. The proposal that I was to train 15 and 16-year-old boys to engage enemy armour made my blood run cold. I was of the steadfast conviction that, regardless of our military situation, to send children to meet a certain death in close combat with shoulder-fired weapons would serve no purpose and could be considered as murder at best. Furthermore, this practice would have little or no effect in stemming an armoured advance by a determined seasoned enemy. The Stabsfeldwebel must have sensed my outrage at this suggestion, and he added that I could also be needed on the Western Front, where the Anglo-American forces were penetrating the Reich's defences. I inquired as to the situation in the East, and he advised me that the Soviets had now breached the defences at Oderbruch. I then replied that I was needed with my division in Kurland, and that I must return to my unit. On the 8th of February, I was accompanied by my father to the Stuttgart train station where I was presented with a container of coffee by a young Red Cross worker before boarding the train to Berlin. The train took me through a thoroughly destroyed country, with intermittent stops that extended the journey to approximately 20 hours. While in Berlin, I came dangerously close to being held by officials from Wehrkreiskommando V, 
and sent to the Upper Rhine Front, where replacements were badly needed to stem the American advance. I was also directed to report to the Oder Front by other authorities. Determined to return to my division, I refused to obey. My desire was to end this war alongside those with whom I had experienced so much, with my old friends and comrades. At the Anhalter train station, I observed officers and field police stopping all personnel in uniform and carefully inspecting identification papers and documents. Numbers of soldiers were being sorted into various groups, where they stood under guard while they waited expectantly in ranks for further instructions. Due to my decorations, I was bypassed by the military police patrols. However, I was soon approached by a senior SS officer who was accompanied by several Kettenhunde, and he politely but firmly instructed me to report to the city commander's office near Potsdamer Platz. I located the commander's office amid the ruins of central Berlin, the blackened, crumbling walls fading ominously into the night sky. Crowds of soldiers stood in ranks at various locations near the headquarters. Officers were observed reporting and departing in confusion as the air was rent by the wailing of air raid sirens. Through the turmoil, an officer informed me that the Russians were only 70 kilometres from Berlin and had already reached Frankfurt am Oder, and that I was to be placed in charge of an alarm unit to be dispatched to this front. My papers were returned to me, and I was further instructed to report to a flak centre near the Berlin radio tower and to board the bus outside for transport to that location. As I exited the makeshift headquarters, I noted the presence of a large military bus that I had been ordered to take to the flak centre. Approximately 50 metres beyond the waiting vehicle, I observed a dim blue light, and I could barely discern the word S-Bahn. Striding past the bus without turning my head, I proceeded to the streetcar stop and disappeared into the stairwell leading underground. With a pounding heart, I soon boarded the car to the Berlin suburb of Zeelendorf West, where I located the residence of my cousin, Dr. Gertrude Brusemler. Zeelendorf had suffered very little damage in the course of the countless bombing raids, and in the neighbourhood of imposing villas, I spent the night discussing events with my cousin. In the neighbouring house lived Theo Lingen, the actor. The following afternoon, Gertrude accompanied me as I proceeded to the Stettiner train station to continue my journey back to Kurland. In this station, as I had experienced at the Anhalter station, patrols were methodically inspecting documents of military personnel. In an attempt to avoid contact with the Kettenhunde and SS patrols, Gertrude and I walked arm in arm, appearing to be a romantic couple deeply engaged in an emotional departing conversation, both of us avoiding eye contact with those around us. Mysteriously, the ruse was effective, for we were not confronted by the authorities. After several minutes, we observed the arrival of a general who was accompanied by a Feldwebel, and I instinctively remained by his side, hoping that his presence could protect me from the squads of military police who appeared to be intent on investigating solitary individuals in uniform. At length I approached him, saluted, and introduced myself. I then explained that I was attempting to return to my unit in Courland, and I asked if I might be permitted to remain with him for a short period of time. Of course, my son, he exclaimed. I understand how important it must be for you to return to your comrades. With this I bid Gertrude farewell, and she quickly departed from the oppressive surroundings. With my irreproachable position next to the general, I was no longer delayed by the police patrols, and as the train began to move, I was invited to remain with him in his coach. He was very friendly, and he informed me that his name was Müller, and that he was en route to Danzig to serve as the city commander. His aide, the Feldwebel, who had arrived with him, accompanied us. The following morning, I arrived at Stettin without further delay. Years later, I was informed that following the capture of Danzig by the Soviets, General Müller had been hanged in that city. Following our arrival in Stettin, I took quarters in the Hotel Danzigerhof, which was under administrative control of the German Navy. For several days I enjoyed life such as I had seldom experienced in the military, confirming to me the widespread belief that our Navy made every effort to care for military personnel. The food was plentiful and delicious, and in the evenings we were entertained by a theatre group, consisting primarily of attractive young women from Vienna. 
Despite the superficial luxury enjoyed in these surroundings, we were ominously aware of the oncoming Russians, who now stood only a short distance from the harbour. The city was packed with refugees who had fled from the onslaught of the Red Army. Numerous makeshift military units consisting of a mixture of individuals drafted from anti-aircraft crews and work brigades or released from military hospitals were to be seen everywhere. Every morning I reported to the Stettin Harbour Control, and after four days a convoy was organised to steam to Kurland by way of Danzig. During my final morning en route to the harbour, I observed an elderly man clothed in a no longer fashionable SA uniform, who had obviously been drafted into the Volkssturm. Bent beneath the weight of a World War I vintage rifle that was slung across his back, he carried a single Panzerfaust over his shoulder, with which he expected to engage the Soviet army. We had reached the end of our strength. Various fishing boats, a destroyer, torpedo boats, minesweepers and two U-boats constituted the escort that was still at anchor in Danzig. While there we observed warships openly engaged in gunfire support for the units locked in battle beyond the sight of the ships. As we proceeded outbound, it became necessary for the minesweepers to clear the area, as it was reported that the British had sown the waters during the night with mines. At midday we broke out onto the open sea near the heights of Memel. The convoy received numerous air attacks from Soviet fighter-bomber squadrons. A bomb damaged the rudder of our ship, which had been a former freighter and was the slowest ship of the convoy. One of the other transports received a vital hit on the starboard side aft, and within fifteen minutes the ship had disappeared beneath the dark waves. Only half the soldiers who had embarked on this vessel were pulled from the water and rescued. During my absence, the Fourth Battle of Courland had taken place between the 24th of January and the 3rd of February. My division had not been heavily committed to this battle, as the Soviet drive had occurred in the areas of Prekuln and Schrunden. The men of the 132d Infantry Division continued to languish in the positions south of Libau. Except for the enemy's minor probes into our lines and some isolated incidents, our sector had remained relatively quiet during my final trip home of the war. With the onset of February, the weather turned mild and spring-like, with blue skies and sunshine accompanied only by a light frost in the morning hours. The soggy earth within the positions and the streets began to dry, and the roads were soon passable once again for a short period. The idyllic weather soon ended with a warm wind out of the south and west, which brought darkly clouded skies and unending thunderstorms. The soldiers from farming families had predicted a stable frost, as stated in the hundred-year calendar for the months of February and March 1st, 945. But even specialists err, and this year nature showed little inclination to follow the calendar. The battle-hardened Courland soldiers, especially those survivors from previous winters farther to the east, where weather is much more severe than near the Baltic, remained in good health. Few illnesses were reported, and those who received light wounds would return as soon as possible to the old caves with their units. The few old men remaining at the front wore silver or gold wound badges pinned to their tunics below their close combat insignia, to indicate five or more wounds received during the course of our odyssey. The positions south of Libau, in which I located my old unit with the 438th Grenadier Regiment, were well constructed. The remainder of the 1st Battalion of Regiment 438, now reduced to little more than a combat group, was situated almost against the Baltic. Positioned in a marshy, low-lying area, the soldiers had constructed a log palisade with a floor of sand that was somewhat higher than the surrounding terrain. Warm bunkers had been constructed up to the very front line, and those who had no iron stove had fabricated chimneys and fireplaces of stone and clay. There remained an abundance of firewood, and the troops preferred to burn split birch, as it created little smoke to betray their location. The men remained cautious about creating any smoke that would disclose their positions to the enemy, but we could observe many columns of smoke daily that revealed the enemy's warm fires in the trenches and forests opposite us. With my first inspection of our positions, I noticed that the quarters were more than just comfortably warm. When one entered the bunkers from the cold and damp air outside, it was as though one had stepped into an oven. 
The troops nevertheless found these hothouses suitable and protested loudly when the bunker door or shelter quarter hanging over the entrance was left open to the cold air outside. The loud, vociferous protests usually implied that the soldiers would rather stink than freeze, and I respected their wishes. Our experience in constructing defences on the Northern Front was put to good use in this sector. It was always interesting to observe how throughout this war, in which the most modern weapons and equipment were employed by all combatants, the use of primitive systems that harkened back to hundreds or even thousands of years were used in the bunkers and positions that wound through the swamps and woods. The blockhouses and palisades constructed by the troops were similar in appearance to those used on the frontier during the American Indian Wars. Bombs, mortar rounds and medium-calibre artillery shells that impacted on the flanks or corners of the positions were capable of inflicting some damage, but the core of the fortresses remained intact. Shell splinters and small arms fire usually could not penetrate the thick logs. As a replacement for the now scarce barbed wire, the troops had used pointed stakes and logs in the marshy woods before us as a means of hindering the enemy assault forces. On the 20th of February, the Russians again attacked our positions with reinforced companies. We came under a medium-strength barrage from artillery batteries, Katyusha rockets and mortars that impacted within our positions and in the open fields behind us. The barrages increased through the morning until the explosions reached a steady crescendo. Believing that the deluge of firepower brought upon us would suffice in putting the foremost lines out of action, the riflemen of a Soviet division assaulted our positions, coming forward in masses as the barrage swept over us. In the wooded sector, they advanced to within 20 metres of our positions before drawing our defensive fire. The attackers were met with a deadly crossfire from machine guns and assault rifles, hand grenades and panzerfausts. Our own artillery opened fire on the Russian positions to the rear of the attackers, and while under fire, I directed the fire from our mortar platoon into the heaviest concentration of fighting. The few men holding the foremost line stood and knelt behind the splintered barricades, shooting into the fleeing brown-clad figures who were now retreating into the swamps and woods. The mortar rounds followed the path of their retreat, and as silence descended on the line, I secured the positions to assess our situation. With a handful of infantrymen, I moved forward between the lines to search the dead scattered before us. As twilight descended, we returned to the safety of our positions, bringing documents and numerous weapons back into our lines. A number of officers were found among the enemy dead, wearing new leather belts and holsters. We retrieved documents from new map cases similar to our own. The uniforms consisted of quilted jackets and pants of excellent quality, and the steel helmets were freshly painted with a new matte surface. We collected a large quantity of pistols and automatic weapons, which revealed 1,944 as the year of manufacture. Upon the bodies of the enemy soldiers were found bundles of grenades and Molotov cocktails, with which they had hoped to destroy our defences once the perimeter had been penetrated. Some of the Russian wounded left lying before our positions, who had feigned death or had lingered while unconscious, now attempted to make their way back to their lines in the growing darkness. Our posts and reconnaissance patrols brought them back into our lines, and they appeared strong, healthy and well-fed. Our lanzers appeared to be ragged scarecrows in comparison, worn and thin from harsh living conditions, but the morale of the Kurland troops remained unshaken. Nevertheless, not a day passed in which skirmishes did not take place, and the enemy forces opposite us continued to grow stronger. Just as our own army had done, the Red Army had previously transferred many units to the East Prussian Front, considered an area of higher priority. Now new units appeared to face us on the Baltic. After suffering such a defeat before our positions in this sector, they did not attempt further penetration through our battalion, but continued to probe and test our defences with reconnaissance patrols and isolated artillery fire. Construction continued in the positions. New ones were being built and old ones were reinforced. Little enemy activity was observed, but occasionally a more daring or foolhardy Russian would be shot by our ever-watchful snipers. New and more spectacular latrine rumours continued to surface 
Many had heard that Army Group Courland was to be ordered to break out to the south toward East Prussia. Others had learned that we were going to be sent to Libau and Windau, the two supply harbours for Courland, to pull back from prepared withdrawal positions and be taken by ship to Germany. The inevitable questions became more dominant in every conversation. What will become of this? How will it end? Is it to be an endless horror from which there will be no escape? Propaganda Minister Goebbels had effectively ensured that we were all aware of the Americans' proposed Morgenthau plan. Germany would be splintered, divided into many feudal-like territories, and would become a purely agrarian pastureland, a goat field. The intelligentsia and officers were to be liquidated, it was said. The living standards of the people would become lower than even that of the Russian peasants under the Bolsheviks. Faced with these macabre predictions of what the future held for Germany, the Lanzers in the trenches remained resolute in their determination to fight to the very end. Later, on the day of the capitulation, some soldiers and officers chose to take their own lives rather than face this bleak future without hope. The cities and villages of the homeland sank under a hail of bombs into soot and ashes. Tens of thousands of refugees from eastern Germany and East Prussia poured into the endless, tearful columns of masses fleeing toward the west before the onslaught of the Soviet army pushing relentlessly toward Berlin. With the beginning of 1945, the situation continued to deteriorate from week to week. The army in Kurland remained fast in the grip of an enemy whose resources in men and material were overwhelmingly superior and were growing constantly stronger. The troops in the forward positions, as well as those in the rear echelons, were fully aware of the now hopeless situation. They had come to know well this enemy that was threatening to overwhelm them, and everyone remained conscious of the fact that behind our backs and at our flanks, the Baltic offered the only escape to Germany. The sparse news from Germany became even more erratic. We no longer received deliveries of mail after the first days of March. It was necessary to rely on the Wehrmacht reports as a source of information, and occasionally one would hear news of the situation in Germany, carefully couched in optimistic overtones, from the soldiers' programme in Libau. Sometimes news briefs published on the front were shared. Finally, as we no longer fully trusted our own sources of information, small circles of friends would share what had been surreptitiously heard over the Swedish radio broadcasts. It was through these bits and pieces of news that we remained informed of the continued massive air attacks of the Anglo-American Air Corps, as well as of the new Soviet offensive between the Oder and the Weichsel. Trapped in Kurland with weapons in hand, we could do nothing further to prevent the cataclysmic fate befalling our country. Despite the bitter news, which grew ever worse from day to day, the Kurland army continued to hold their positions as ordered. Tie down enemy forces in the Baltic to lighten the task of defending the borders of the Reich. For those troops holding out in Kurland, a special award was authorised in the form of a Kurland cuff band. This band was manufactured in a small mill in Goldingen, and Latvian women were contracted to complete this last German war decoration by hand in small groups in their homes. The band was 38 millimetres in width and bore upon it an embroidered crest, the Teutonic Knight's Order with the Balkan Cross against a silver-grey background, and the elk head borrowed from the city seal of Mittal. Between the two crests were the stark black letters spelling Kurland, March and April passed with little activity. It was not until the Fifth Battle of Courland that we again saw heavy action. We relieved the greatly weakened 126th Infantry Division in the area west and northwest of Prekuln, and this area on the Vartaya was to be our last stand until the day of capitulation. In the left sector before Bunker, the Red Army once again massed a large force to attack the German front and to push through toward Libo. The assault suffered a severe defeat, and the Soviets withdrew under heavy fire from Nebelwerfer Regiment 70 and the Army Flak Battalion 276. The 14th Panzer Division, together with the 21st Luftwaffe Field Division, secured the sector, and the Soviets withdrew only after suffering heavy casualties, leaving large numbers of dead and wounded on the battlefield in front of the German positions. The Red Army did not appear to recover fully from the defeat in this sector. 
and after the 28th of February, the enemy no longer attempted to penetrate this limited area with a large-scale attack. Mid-March brought a thaw, reducing the streets and roads to little more than bottomless quagmires, over which nothing could travel without great exertion. The earthworks and machine gun positions seemed to be devoured by the grey-black mud, and even the activity on the Soviet side came almost to a halt, the impassable roads spoiling any immediate plans for a further attack. On the 18th of March, a short but heavy artillery barrage fell on our positions, as if to announce the opening of the last great battle of Kurland. Units from the division were sent into action near Frauenburg and Schrunden, where they battled the Soviet attack until the offensive ground to a halt, the enemy tanks and support vehicles sinking in the swampy morass. The adverse conditions for the Lanzers holding the line had become indescribable, and words cannot express the sacrifices and suffering of the troops during these final days. Following another breakthrough by the Soviet 8th Guards Division, the Russians were beaten back by the division on our left flank, situated to the south of Schrunden, the enemy suffering great losses. More than 500 prisoners, 263 tanks, 249 machine guns, 185 field guns, 29 mortars and 27 aircraft were taken, exemplifying the determination of the Lancers to hold to the last. In mid-April, the 18th Army awaited another large-scale attack. The 1st Battalion of Regiment 438 was relieved at the front and assigned as reserve in preparation for the battle. The battle did not come. The enemy had begun placing all efforts and resources in the battle for Central Europe and was no longer willing to continue sacrificing large numbers of troops against the stubborn German defences between Riga and Libau. Thus, we also were compelled to wait. The front remained relatively quiet but did not sleep. Our lines were penetrated constantly by Russian reconnaissance units who exhibited great skill in their ability to slip past the thinly held positions, which still averaged two men per 100 metres of line to defend. These reconnaissance squads were invariably infiltrating and joining numerous secret partisan units in the rear areas, which displayed more activity as the weeks passed. On the Kurland front there was no rest, and simply to lie and sleep had become a foreign, unknown luxury as we struggled to survive. The grenadiers in the foremost positions hardly took notice that spring had arrived. On the evening of the 1st of May, 1945, we learned that Grofaz, the greatest warlord of all time, was dead. In general, news of the death of Hitler was received by the troops with indifference. However, it must also be said that some breathed a sigh of relief. During one of the nights shortly thereafter, a barrage broke forth from the enemy lines, and after a short pause we heard the raucous voice of a Russian propagandist blaring from a loudspeaker, Berlin is ours! Early the following morning, I observed in the dim light of the sunrise large letters of wood or cardboard impaled on posts spelling out Russians in Berlin at the edge of the woods 400 metres opposite us. Before dusk, a heavy machine gun crew opened fire on the offending message and hacked the sign to pieces. On the 5th of May, the battalion received instructions to send out a reconnaissance team to bring in prisoners in order to learn which unit lay opposite our positions. I selected several trusted Lanzers, and after nightfall we departed our lines. Before dawn we returned with two terrified Russians who were turned over to the division for interrogation. In carrying out this assignment, Kurt, my communicator, received the dubious distinction of having been the last member of the company to be wounded during the war. He was grazed across his shoulder by a bullet fired from a Soviet submachine gun, and the superficial wound required only a tetanus shot and bandage. He insisted on remaining with us in our forward positions, despite my efforts to send him to the rear. 8 May 1st, 945 opened with brilliant sunshine. Throughout the previous days and weeks, remarkable rumours had consistently surfaced in the desperate hope that we would be spared. It was said that the Courland army was finally to be evacuated. Supposedly the Western Allies were standing at rest on the Elbe River, and the remnants of the German Wehrmacht were reorganising and massing to throw the Russians back over the old borders of the Reich and out of the heart of Europe. The Americans, the English and the French had at last recognised that the Bolsheviks surging toward the West posed a threat to all of Europe. 
We were not to be betrayed and sold out to the Red Army after all. Other reports stated that the English and American fleets had been dispatched to evacuate the troops in Kurland, and even that we were to join with the Americans, who were now engaged in open battle against the Russians on the Elbe. We were soon advised of another decision via reliable channels, and this devastating news served to extinguish any optimistic hopes of evacuation within the near future. British Field Marshal Montgomery had accepted the terms of surrender of Admiral von Friedberg in the North German zone, but these terms were to be valid only for the Western Front. The only hope remaining was that the Supreme Allied Commander, General Eisenhower, would also agree to such terms, and that it would also be considered as valid for the army in the eastern sectors. To do so would have served to extricate the long columns of refugees from the horror descending on them in the form of the Soviet army, as well as saving the troops still opposing the Soviets from the insufferable fate of languishing for years in gulags and prison camps. We belatedly received word that on the 1st of May, the commander of Army Group Kurland, General Oberst Hilpert, had released a status communique, which passed verbally through the positions to the foremost lines. To continue pursuing the war in the West has lost all reason and has thus come to an end. The battle in the East is to continue with the same tenacity we have consistently displayed. The Army commanders and the Fatherland, though bleeding from many wounds, fully expect the Kurland soldiers to fulfil their duty to the last. Officers and men must continue to have faith. The Army Group is later to be sent into action on the Elbe, and the evacuation plan for the Kurland Army continues to remain in effect. Our 132D Infantry Division held the battle sector to the west of Prekulm, in the southern part of the Kurland Front, approximately 30 kilometres from Libau. While we continued to repulse Russian troops probing the front lines, behind us marched units of the 11th and 24th Infantry Divisions toward the harbour at Libau. Throughout the last three days, Kriegsmarine vessels of all types in Libau and Windau took on board as many personnel as possible. The naval commanders received by radio this message from the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht to Heller, Libau, Windau and Bornholm. From the 5th of May, 8 o'clock German summertime, a ceasefire with the opposing units of Field Marshal Montgomery will be in effect. All available transport at sea shall continue as ordered by the Kriegsmarine to save German personnel from the east. Do not engage, destroy, or sink any vessels. Safety is paramount. The naval communicators on board ships and vessels received this message on the 6th of May from the German Sea Command. To all ships in the Baltic, due to impending surrender, all sea and security forces, as well as freighters, must have left the harbours of Kurland and Heller no later than zero o'clock, the 9th of May, 1945. The transport from the east of German citizens shall be carried out with the highest priority. The German sailors of the Kriegsmarine attempted to save what little remained. The 5th Patrol Boat Flotilla fought a final sea battle against Russian motor torpedo boats and was successful in sinking one of them in combat. But the dice had been cast to decide our destiny. General Eisenhower would recognise the ceasefire on the Western Front only if the remaining German forces still opposing the Soviets in the East were to lay down their arms as well. The Allies possessed an immeasurable superiority in aircraft, armour and artillery with which they were fully capable of totally destroying the remnants of the German forces. It was reported that in order to end the resistance of the German units stubbornly holding out in Kurland, the Russians had already transferred armoured regiments from Berlin to set in motion against us. On the 7th of May, the commander of Army Group Kurland sent an offer to surrender by telegraph to the Russian command. The Soviets agreed only under the conditions that the surrender be conducted by Hilpert in person. They wanted their victory in the last hour to be as politically valuable as possible. In this manner, the favoured general of the Kurland fighters followed the most difficult path of his life, that of obeying his last orders to surrender his soldiers to an unspeakable fate. He was never again to see Germany, perishing in 1946 behind the barbed wire of a Soviet prison camp. During the night of 7 the 8th of May, our division received the order to all forces. Marshal Govorov has agreed to a cease of hostilities to begin 14 o'clock, 
the 8th of May, 1945. All units are to immediately heed this command. White flags are to be displayed from all positions. Loyal obedience in the execution of this order is expected by the Supreme Commander of all troops. The destiny of all personnel in Kurland is dependent upon close adherence to this order. Two days prior to the capitulation, each battalion was permitted to select 12 soldiers, fathers with many children, to be sent to the rear to await transport to Germany. The chosen individuals reported in full marching equipment to the battalion headquarters to await their final assignment. Not a murmur was heard from those whose fate it was to remain behind. Throughout the ranks, the discipline and strong sense of comradeship prevailed to the last minute. Thirty-five aging Tantaju 52 aircraft arrived in direct flight from Norway to Kurland to take these men on board. The men filed onto the planes. As the glittering fuselages with thundering motors lifted from the Grobin airfield, the soldiers who were left behind followed the departure with moist eyes. No one could have imagined the fate that would befall this last airlift from Kurland. Shortly following the departure, the planes were attacked by a band of Russian fighters who shot down 32 of the slow-moving, defenceless aircraft. They were the last planes of the German Luftwaffe, which, with all evacuees on board, went down in flames to find their graves on foreign soil and in the cold waters of the Baltic Sea. Other unnerving scenes took place on the 8th of May at the loading docks in the harbours of Libau and Windau. Members of the 11th Infantry and the 14th Panzer Divisions, the two fire brigades of the Kurland Army, filed aboard the hastily assembled vessels of the 9th Kriegsmarine Security Flotilla. The sailors manning the minesweepers, fishing boats, ferries and harbour cutters jettisoned all excess equipment and freight in order to make room for as many men as possible. The soldiers patiently waiting to depart exhibited another enduring display of iron discipline. Under the murderous strafing fire of Russian fighters and through the explosions of bombs, there were no complaints, no panic, no turbulent scenes. As the load of human cargo on board the ships reached dangerous levels, the naval officers halted the columns of troops filing onto the low-lying vessels. A number of the younger men, seeing that there was no more space available, voluntarily surrendered their places on board and departed the ships to enable older soldiers with families to be rescued. As the lines were cast off, the vessels slowly steamed toward the open Baltic. The commander of the 18th Army, General de Infanterie Boege, called to those departing Libau. Greet the homeland for all the Kurland fighters. With foaming bows, the ships ploughed against the high waves of the Baltic en route to the western ports. Suddenly, Russian fighter bombers appeared in the sky and descended like birds of prey on the slow-moving vessels. During the initial attacks, some evacuees lost their lives to the machine guns and cannons of the aircraft, and in strict obedience to orders, not a shot was fired in defence. As the planes banked and approached for a second attack, however, they were met with a murderous barrage of defensive fire, and they turned and disappeared over the horizon. Three of the vessels transporting the 44th East Prussian Grenadier Regiment were unable to keep pace with the convoy, and made port in Trailerborg. Despite the ostensible neutrality practised by Sweden throughout the war, these soldiers were later delivered to the Soviet Union. Some of the ships that departed the Vindau harbour were intercepted by Russian torpedo boats on the high sea. The leading ship Rugard turned and faced the oncoming vessels to allow the two accompanying minesweepers to break away and attempt escape. The 1,300 men on board waited with bated breath as they anticipated the worst. The sailors of the Rugard reassembled the dismounted breech block of the 88mm deck gun. As the enemy craft continued closing, their intentions to halt the vessel became obvious. The first shot left the barrel, and simultaneously they received the order over the radio telephone from the fleet admiral to continue steaming forward. With this shot, the leading Soviet boat received a direct hit, and accompanied by the others turned and retreated, leaving the Rugard to continue its journey. Thus ended the last sea battle in Europe, and more than 25,000 men of the Kurland army made their way over the Baltic to German harbours in Holstein.
In early May, the men in the foremost positions were not fully aware of the events taking place far to the rear of the 132D Infantry Division. They did not hear the words of the last Wehrmacht report sent on the 9th of May 1945, which was to be the last official command from Germany. Our army group in Kurland, which has successfully resisted overwhelming armour and infantry opposition for months, has demonstrated courage and endurance without equal in six major battles. In the early morning hours I stepped from the bunker of the 4th Heavy Machine Gun Company at the Vartaya streambed and blinked in the sweet, cool air of a new spring day. In sparse patches where the earth was not torn by the battle that had raged for months around us, nature began to show new growth, bright green sprouts shooting from the dark soil. Even the saplings and bushes, torn by shrapnel and shell splinters, revealed tiny buds breaking forth as if to display that despite the insanity mankind had wrought upon itself, life would continue. I was startled from these foreign thoughts by several mortar rounds that impacted in quick succession nearby. The company still possessed six heavy machine guns, four 80mm mortars, and two heavy 120mm mortars on the battlefront and the men had received no wounds since Kurt had received the shoulder wound during action two days previously. At the mortar position, which I had situated in a depression 200 metres behind the headquarters, we received isolated rifle fire from the enemy positions. Using two heavy machine guns situated deep within the battle line, I opened fire on the opposing tree line from where most enemy activity was observed. The Russians replied with artillery. Our own gunners returned fire. At approximately nine o'clock, a band of fighters overflew the battalion positions and released bombs from the shining silver fuselages. Several of the fragmentation bombs exploded behind the mortar position without causing any damage. The forward observers reported strong enemy movement in the hinterland of the opposite enemy rifle brigade. The communicators reported to me that our land lines with the battalion were temporarily cut by the shelling and we prepared our weapons and waited for an attack. At exactly 12 o'clock, we received a radio report from the regiment that struck like lightning from the heavens. At 14 o'clock, the Kurland army will capitulate. White flags are to be displayed along the front lines. All personnel will remain in position under arms. Weapons are to be unloaded, magazines removed and barrels cleared. Officers are to continue to command their units. At 13 o'clock, I heard for the last time over the field telephone the voice of Hauptmann von Daimling, the regimental adjutant. He sharply instructed me not to do anything irrational, to stop the shooting immediately, and to exhibit responsibility in ensuring that the capitulation order, which he repeated verbally, was carried out. He emphasised that strict compliance would determine the fate of the entire front sector. The news of the order for unconditional surrender raced throughout the ranks. For years we had been fighting desperately, burying our dead and refusing to capitulate to a vicious enemy whom we still wholeheartedly opposed. I made the rounds of our position, speaking to the men of the unknown fate that lay before us and attempting to calm their nerves. We no longer feared the prospect of death, for we had lived and dealt intimately with it for years to the extent that death on a battlefield in the East was an eventuality that was to be expected, that our inevitable fate was to find a final resting place in an unmarked grave in Russia. The fear that possessed us was the fear of the unknown, of not knowing what was to become of us, and more important, of our families in Germany. We had long been aware of what had happened at Katyn in Poland, where the Russians had liquidated thousands of Polish officers, and we had no reason not to expect a similar fate should we fall into the hands of the enemy. The philosophy of fighting to the death had become so ingrained within us during the past years that to surrender, as we were now being ordered to do, was inconceivable. The silence that had fallen on the front was broken by the report of a pistol shot a short distance away. On investigating, I discovered that one of our officers, receiving word of the capitulation order, had pulled his Luger pistol from the holster, laid it on his map case, and on his notepad had written, Without an army there is no honour. He had then calmly pressed the muzzle of his pistol against his temple and squeezed the trigger. A company commander ran toward me wildly, waving his pistol and screaming, I won't surrender! 
I ordered him to holster his weapon and to return to his company, to which he responded with threats. I then pulled my own pistol and he disappeared into the undergrowth of the Vartaya stream bed, still screaming, No surrender! I refuse to surrender! I was later to learn that he had raced toward the rear, where he had confronted the commander of a self-propelled gun, and with still-drawn pistol attempted to force the officer to advance toward the line with the heavy weapons, all the while screaming, They are surrendering up on the line! One of the Lanzers eventually clubbed him with a rifle butt, and he fell unconscious to the ground. He did in fact go into captivity. However, while in the prison camp he was also to remain something of a psychiatric case for the Russians. The enemy had launched a final assault on our sister regiment, Infantry Regiment 436, on the last morning of the war in Europe. The order for capitulation was received by Uncle Sepp Drexel during the course of the attack, and it was necessary for him to use every art of persuasion upon the battalion commander to obtain a ceasefire. That afternoon, Oberst Drexel received General Radionov, the commander of the Soviet division opposite Drexel's own sector. The Russians were standing with massed artillery and an entire division of infantry opposite Drexel's positions, and made this pointedly clear to the German Oberst. The Soviet general was accompanied by his intelligence officer, who compared maps with the German staff officers. The extent to which they were informed of our positions was remarkable. Several weeks before the surrender, the intelligence officer had penetrated our thinly held lines and, disguised as a civilian, had surveyed the entire hinterland of the front. Oberst Drexel could only chuckle at the intruder's notes, in which he was often referred to as Uncle Sepp. The intelligence officer was also aware that Blonde Fred, the battalion commander of 1st Battalion Infantry Regiment 436, enjoyed tipping a glass on occasion. The Russians expressed surprise that our lines had been so thinly defended. One of the causes of their astonishment was the fact that in the Soviet army for every three men on the front line, one remained in the rear as support. In the German army the opposite was true. The Russian officers were then taken to General Demmer for the official surrendering of the division. The bulk of the division was assembled on the evening of the 8th of May at the division headquarters from where the men then marched for many days en route to the prisoner assembly camp at Tel Shay. At 14 o'clock, our position was marked with ragged shirts, socks and bandages stuck on the ends of rifle barrels. With this sign of surrender, a khaki brown wave surged forth from the forest's edge opposite us. The Russians swarmed into our positions, their new uniforms and well-fed bodies a striking contrast to our ragged appearance our bodies thin from malnourishment and bleached pale from months of living beneath the earth in bunkers. The Soviets ignored the weapons and equipment and ran among the soldiers still standing in their positions, ripping decorations and insignia from uniforms and tearing watches and rings from the upraised arms. I was still wearing my camouflage battle smock over my tunic and was thus spared this plundering. I immediately ordered all personnel to assemble at the company command post, and stationed a soldier approximately every ten metres along a perimeter with an assault rifle, the bolt open and without a magazine in the weapon. With this action the Russians ceased their plundering and wandered elsewhere in search of loot. A young Russian artillery lieutenant appeared at my company headquarters. He was of impeccable appearance, wearing a clean, well-fitting uniform. He had a slender face from which two wide blue eyes gazed steadily at me as I approached. From his appearance, he could have been one of many German students in Heidelberg or Tübingen. We greeted one another with a salute, and he drew a map from a thick leather case, stating that he needed to be advised of our artillery positions. I was able to provide him with only the approximate information, and he expressed amazement that our batteries were positioned so far to the rear. He continued to ask, Why? Why did you keep shooting? Hitler long kaput? Roving bands of Russian soldiers had reappeared, and they danced about the unmoving ranks of the grenadiers, singing, Gitler kaput, Voina kaput. A childish naivete beamed from their round faces as they danced and sang. The nightmare of war was now erased from their consciousness. The ranks of lancers could reply only with stony silence, their faces reflecting the bitterness and frustration of the moment. Eventually the victors departed, 
and we received no further reports from the regiment, the last order having been to remain in our positions. At approximately fifteen o'clock, a pony cart appeared before our bunkers and drew to a halt at our command post. Alone on the cart was a squat Soviet major with oriental features and a pockmarked complexion. He sprang to the ground and approached my position on bowed legs, a row of medals hanging from ribbons on his tunic. We greeted one another with a traditional military salute, his coal-black eyes darting furtively over our surroundings. From a former container for mortar fuses, he pulled a strip of paper from a section of Pravda and a pinch of Machorka tobacco and offered me a cigarette. I politely refused and extended to him a German Eckstein, which he accepted with a nod. I then called for Lehmann, one of our soldiers who spoke fluent Russian, to serve as a translator. As he translated the words of the Major, it was made clear that we were to march across the lines to the Soviet positions. He added that officers would retain their sidearms for maintaining discipline. I explained that I could not comply, as my last orders were to remain in position, and no other orders had been received. He nodded thoughtfully, climbed back on the pony cart and returned to his lines. About thirty minutes later he reappeared and again through the translator ordered me to march the men across the lines. I repeated that no orders from our regiment had been received and with this he pulled his pistol from the holster at his side and responded, saying that if I refused, then he would shoot me and the men would follow him. To this I could only reply, da da, in acknowledgement. I then gave the order for the men to form a column and march the battalion forward. We marched several kilometres along the road through the forest in the direction of Prikuln, and we were amazed at the overwhelming numbers of Russians who had opposed us. The forest was filled with T-34 tanks, the supply units were crowded with Studebaker trucks parked bumper to bumper. As we proceeded along the road, we encountered an oncoming column of T-34 tanks, heavily camouflaged with tree branches and protected from our anti-tank weapons by thick logs lashed to the chassis. The lead driver swerved sharply toward the column of prisoners, and we stepped aside and marched past the Soviet tank crews, who glared down at us from the dark turrets. We soon came to a small clearing in the forest where a Russian colonel had assembled his staff. In a half circle stood the staff officers. Among them were a number of women wearing immaculate, tight-fitting uniforms, their eyes wide in amazement as they viewed us from under wide fur caps. The unfamiliar and long-forgotten smell of perfume wafted toward us. The column was brought to a halt, and I strode forward to formally surrender the 1st Battalion, 438th Regiment, to the enemy. After several long seconds of silence, I heard a low voice from the ranks of Soviet officers remark, Karoshi discipline, Nonoga discipline. Good discipline, much discipline. The colonel greeted me with a salute, followed by a handshake, something that I had not expected. He asked repeatedly, Pachevu, why did you continue to fight? Hitler is long dead. I replied simply, because we are soldiers. I was then approached by a staff officer wearing the blue-piped cap of the NKVD, who inquired as to the fate of the two Russians we had captured several days previously. I explained that they had been turned over to the regiment in good health, and he replied in broken German, If not true, then... and he slapped his holster threateningly. I was then asked if all weapons had been surrendered. I unbuckled my pistol belt and handed it to one of the officers then turned and asked the men standing motionless in ranks if any arms were still carried. An NCO stepped forward and attempted to give a Russian officer a P-38 pistol, to which the officer responded, Niet, Niet, shaking his head vigorously. I then took the proffered weapon, removed the magazine, cleared the chamber and tossed it onto the roadside. It was explained to me that we would be treated correctly and that we would soon be released and returned to our homes again. I clung desperately to these words with a glimmer of hope that perhaps the long nightmare was indeed coming to an end. I was then escorted a short distance from the column and invited to eat at a table piled high with food. I was amazed to see condiments of every description, including the cases of canned goods bearing the familiar label, Oscar Mayer Chicago. I politely refused the invitation, explaining that a German officer cannot eat unless the men are fed as well. The colonel appeared surprised at this response, and I was unceremoniously escorted back to the waiting column of prisoners. 
We were then assigned a mounted Cossack as an escort, and he repeatedly raced along the length of the column without a saddle at breakneck speed. Shortly after leaving the clearing, we were again descended upon by swarms of Russians who poured from the forest, falling on the column to tear wedding rings, watches and military decorations from the prisoners. I motioned for the Cossack, who galloped up to me and brought his mount to a sharp halt. I then removed my watch and offered it to him, explaining that he had been given responsibility to maintain order, and that in violation of this order the men were being plundered of personal belongings. He nodded grimly, and springing to the ground, he selected a stout stick from the forest's edge and leapt back on the horse. He then galloped headlong into the ranks of plundering Russians. Wielding the stick like a sabre, he swung wildly at the mob, viciously striking them on their hands, arms and backs until they retreated to the protection of the forest. As the sun was setting behind us, we were marched to a prisoner collection point in an old cemetery, and as darkness descended, the Russians began to celebrate their final victory. Wildly firing over our heads with submachine guns, rifles and pistols, they danced in the light of flares fired into the sky while we were forced to lie flat on the ground to avoid being struck as tracer bullets bounced and ricocheted among the tombstones. The Soviets gathered around us, rejoicing in their victory with a macabre dance, chanting, Gitler kaput, Voina kaput, in an unending chorus, leaping and springing in ecstasy while firing into the air. At dawn, the officers were separated from the enlisted men. The pain of defeat had begun. The heads of the soldiers were shorn, and the ranks formed into massive columns to be herded like cattle toward the east. Small groups of German soldiers captured earlier in the war appeared before us, representing the Antifa organization, the National Committee for Free Germany, and spoke of the benefits of communism. The presence and words of the collaborators were met with cold silence from the Kurland veterans. After several hours, we were again on the march. After three days of steady marching, we received our first rations, a thin broth in which floated bits of cabbage leaves. This was only an indication of what our future would bring. The illusion of good treatment first assured us soon came to an end, as the rear echelon units did not recognise the fairness observed by soldiers at the front. The endless march along the primitive roads through swamps and forests had begun. The column moved painfully between heavily armed guards lining the roadsides, through the shroud of total defeat toward the east, to a final end of the war and to an unknown destiny.